Greetings to you all, and welcome to the 10th for 2022 of the SAPES Trust Policy Dialogue Forum on Zoom. Today, we're looking at China-Africa relations, a comparative analysis of Chinese investments in Eastern and Southern Africa. And we have two experts. We have Deborah Brattigam, Director of the China Africa Research Initiative at John Hopkins University School of Advanced International Studies. And the young scholar from Tanzania, Gilead Terry, who is doing a, a doctorate on US-China competition in Africa an economist. Um, it really is areas political economy of infrastructure development in East Africa at the University of Manchester. We have discussions we have uh, Chennai, Tampa said who has been on this platform before, a development economist. And I would like you to have Innocent Batsani Ube, a postdoctoral research fellow at SOAS, also involved in the China studies and Claude Kabemba, who might join us from the Southern National Resource Watch, uh, which, which is looking at really at the nature and content of extractive industries in, uh, in uh, Southern Africa. The background to this, I may just, if I may just digress, the background to this is that I was two weeks ago uh, one of the participants in the Nyerere, US Nyerere Centenary celebrations at the University of Dar es Salaam, a very nostalgic event uh, for some of us who had been in University of Dar es Salaam as the lecturers in the 70s. And in the course of that, uh, Gilead Terry presented a paper. On, on infrastructure development. So that sparked this idea of this discussion. And then by sheer coincidence, one of the experts we've been looking for, um, Deborah Rodrigam, was visiting Zimbabwe. In fact, she's in Zimbabwe right now. And so it was a happy coincidence. So we have two very able and very uh, informed people in, in this area. The other matter which prompted this discussion is, was the glaring contrast in, in development, especially in the area of, of infrastructure, between my own country, Zimbabwe, and East Africa, Tanzania, and Kenya in particular, which has caused me to conclude that we in Zimbabwe were 40 years behind. Countries which were in 1980 were said to be far behind Zimbabwe. And if you remember 1980 in Yerere visiting, state visit in July 1980, he said to have told Mugabe, this is a jewel, please don't destroy the jewel. Well, clearly the jewel is no longer such. And so I was pleasantly impressed. And it, it really evolved around the nature of investment, the Chinese investment in particular. And you see the skyline in Dar es Salaam, you see this Chinese signature cross from the airport to the harbor, Dar es Salaam harbor. Uh, it's all clear. When you get to Nairobi, the roads from the airport, which is take a good 45 to a, a minutes to now 15 minutes, we are in town from the airport. And the airports right now, is Zimbabwe's Harare uh, airport is being developed by Chinese companies. And likewise, we have a, a airport at Victoria Falls, a glamorous one. And likewise in Osaka, and Dar es Salaam. So, as the title suggests, we'd like to consider one, what are the motivations of Chinese investment? Secondly, is, there, secondly, is there any differences in terms of 
the nature of investment between Southern Africa and Eastern Africa, the, especially in the power, transport, mining, and construction industries. So I'll ask Debra to start the discussion for us. Debra, brought together. Debra. Debra, you muted. Hello. Yeah. Hello. Okay. So hello everyone. Um, let's see. Yeah. Uh, thank you for having me here. I'm thrilled to be in Zimbabwe speaking to you. Um, I am going to just give you a little overview with some data, and I'm going to try to share my screen. So let's see if we can make this happen with this technology. So there's my, that's what I want to share. And I'll bring it into. Yeah, yeah it's working. Great. So I want to put it into the, what do we do? Slideshow. Okay, there we go. Play from start. All right, so this is a presentation prepared for your uh, seminar tonight on China-Africa relations. So I thought at the beginning I would give a, an overview of some of the Africa-wide data. And so what we can see here is China-Africa trade, and it's quite obviously uh, gone up from 2002, where it was barely uh, visible, into a, a height of 2015. And then because so much of the trade is commodity related, when commodity prices, especially oil fell, the trade fell. And the black part there is China's imports from the continent. So those shrank, uh, but the exports also shrank as well. And those exports have been slowly growing as African economies have recovered, but then uh, the pandemic hit at the end of this period. And that's not very well reflected yet. So the next slide is, um, Yes, we're ready to get to the next slide. Um, so let me try that. Okay. Yeah, the next slide is Chinese foreign direct investment. And I have to say that the data on foreign direct investment is not very good, in part because um, a lot of Chinese foreign direct investment goes out of China um, through Hong Kong. And it does that because Hong Kong is an offshore financial center. And so anything that comes from Hong Kong on to the African continent doesn't get captured by this. Or if it goes to Mauritius or other offshore financial centers, it will look like investment coming from those centers into Africa. So that won't capture all of either China or the United States. But what this shows is, I think, an interesting comparison. So the blue is um, the United States and the red is China. So it's foreign direct investment, equity investment in this case. And so China's equity investment has been going up. It's still not that long on an annual basis. So this is a flow per year. But what's striking to me when I, I show this to Americans is how um, the U.S. foreign investment in Africa has been going down, down, down. And you can see in several years, like 2016 and 2019, it's actually been negative. So there's been more uh, repatriation of capital going from Africa to the United States than vice versa. So this is China's global foreign aid. We don't have an official, all of these are official figures. We don't have an official figure um, for foreign aid to Africa, but we do know that the official foreign aid to Africa is about 40 to 50% of the total of China's foreign aid expenditure. And this only includes things like the zero interest loan, the grants, uh, for example, Zimbabwe's parliament building is built out of the foreign aid budget. It doesn't include all of the other um, China Exim Bank, most of the China Exim Bank loans are not covered under this foreign aid expenditure. But we can also see that that dropped in 2016 um, and started to go up again. So it reached a peak in 2019. These are not adjusted for inflation, by the way. And then this is also official data. And what this shows is, is something that a lot of people don't talk about or notice. And it's Chinese construction companies Projects in Africa, these are the gross annual turnover or the gross annual revenues of Chinese companies that are doing projects in the continent. 
And so what we can see here, if you can look at the figures, this is a very, very significant figures, $50 billion a year in 2014 through about 2018. And it's been going down as, uh, as the economies have been weakening on the continent. But uh, much of what I think Ibo was looking at in Dar es Salaam, many of the buildings there are built by Chinese companies. They may not be funded by China or Chinese banks or China's foreign aid program. Some of them will be, but many of the uh, buildings that I've seen in Dar also are just funded by others and Chinese uh, construction companies win those contracts. And that's very common. So about $50 billion around the continent. Now here's something uh, on the more controversial side, the number of Chinese workers in Africa. And so we can see again, this peaked in about 2015 where there were over 250,000 Chinese workers. Now I wanna tell you that the majority of these workers go to a very small number of countries. They are mainly in North Africa, in countries like Algeria. And before that, it used to be Libya. Uh, but Algeria has a, a, the lion's share of this. And Angola is also a country with a lot of Chinese workers, uh, traditionally, because there have been a lot of Chinese construction projects there. We can talk more about that later if you're interested. So the next is an overview of Chinese lending in Africa. And most of the data here, not all of it, but most of this comes from a database that I started um, at Johns Hopkins University of Chinese loans in Africa. And it's loan by loan, uh, country by country, project by project. We have over a thousand loans. And now this, um, this database is being curated by Boston University. So we've partnered with them because they have a global database. So we've uh, added our Africa data to theirs. So what we see here, first of all, again, is the picture for the continent. And what we can see from 2000 is that the, the share of loans has been uh, somewhat uneven. There was a peak in 2013. And I point to this because 2013 was the first year of uh, what we know as the Belt and Road Initiative. Um, and another significant thing about this slide is that the red uh, portions of these columns refer to loans to Angola. And so you can see right away that a lot of Chinese lending, in fact, it's about almost a third of Chinese lending in total during this period has gone to Angola. If you take Angola out and just look at the blue, you can see again that it peaked in 2013. And since then it's been going down. So it's not just during the pandemic that that happens. So another important uh, finding in our research is that it's kind of a, a misnomer to talk about China because there are multiple Chinese lenders. There are multiple Chinese actors. And in my field, we call China a fragmented authoritarian system. It's not something where Xi Jinping sits at the peak of power and directs everything, obviously. It's a very complex system. So there are multiple Chinese lenders and they're not very well controlled or monitored or managed uh, in Beijing. So here in Zimbabwe, we have only two lenders. There's the China International Development Cooperation Agency, SIDCA, the foreign aid agency, and China Exim Bank. And in other parts of Africa, you also find China Development Bank, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, Bank of China, and 25 other Chinese banks and companies in our data. So if you look at the Zambia example, it's rather extreme, uh, but it's illuminating. So this is the data for Chinese lending to Zambia by lender. And you can see here that it breaks down with China Exim Bank in blue, um, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China in yellow, contractors or suppliers credits coming in in green, other commercial banks in orange, uh, China Development Bank in turquoise, Sidka, the little bit of purple there. And so Zimb uh, Zambia right now is having to negotiate in the common framework um, it's going to have to negotiate with 18 different Chinese lenders, as well as dozens of other lenders uh, that, um, to which Zambia owes money. So this shows how uh, debt relief and debt restructuring is very complicated. And Chinese uh, have made it even more complicated coming in. So a little bit on Africa and debt. What this slide shows here is a picture of history from 1980 to 2020. And what we have there here is public and publicly guaranteed debt stock. This data is from the World Bank as a percentage of gross national income during this period. 
And so what we see here is um, the, and I, I'll point to just a few here, the purple, you can see that how the purple slide at the bottom of the purple uh, band is very, very small in the early years, but it gets bigger. And we, by the time we get to 2020, the purple is the largest across the continent. And then we have the Navy blue band, which is multilateral lending of various kinds, African Development Bank, et cetera. And then green is the World Bank, also quite significant. The blue is bilateral lenders that are not China. This includes the Paris Club, but also uh, countries like India, Brazil. Um, and then red is China. And so you can see how Chinese lending has been growing and growing, but it's still as a percentage of, G, of gross national income across the continent, it still is not um, the, the largest. Um, and, although it's, and then also at the African debt problem is growing again, but it's nowhere near what it was in the 1980s and 1990s. Still something to be concerned about. Um, here we look at debt service and there the Chinese, because many of the Chinese loans are commercial loans, um, China has a larger share of debt service than it is of debt per se. So in 2022, this year, 30% of debt service in the countries, the poor countries that were eligible for the debt service suspension initiative of the G20, 30% um, of their debt service this year will be going to China, official bilateral China. And here the World Bank is including China Development Bank, which China doesn't agree with, um, but that's included in that 30%. And also a lot of that is for Angola, as we, um, as we saw before. We can come back to any of this data. So again, this, I'm gonna go over this very quickly, but this was before the pandemic, Chinese loan commitments from our data um, between 2000, 2000 to 2018, aggregated all together as a percent of GNI. And we did this in order to look at the countries that were more at risk and before the pandemic. We saw Zambia up there, the Republic of Congo, Angola was there, but they were not yet um, considered by the international uh, community to be um, at risk of debt distress, Djibouti. And then you can see there's a whole cluster down at the bottom of which Ethiopia, Cameroon have all come emerged now as debt distressed countries. But a lot of the countries that have borrowed from China are, were not at risk of debt distress. They're down there at that lower lower level here. So it's, it's these outliers that are, are the ones that are, are of concern. And those are in this little list here. So we, in 2018, we identified um, uh, seven countries, uh, which would not including Kenya, um, where China was the number one creditor. And we said, these are the ones to watch. These are the ones where the Chinese lending is really the problem. So Zambia, Ethiopia, Cameroon, Angola, Djibouti, Republic of Cong Congo, and Mozambique. And the rest of the countries in Africa, uh, Chinese lending was not a significant issue. This does not include Sudan or Zimbabwe because the World Bank didn't have data for them. And they're also not DSSI eligible. So now to focus, uh, and I won't be talking too much longer on the Southern and Eastern African countries of, of the focus tonight. So we've, we pulled out some data um, for just for these countries. And so this is um, from China, total lending, uh, FDI and contracting revenues. Remember I showed you the Chinese contractors, their revenues from doing projects, which may not be paid for by Chinese loans. And then FDI is equity investment only. And then lending is in blue. So if we look at, and these are all as a percentage, it's normalized to be a percentage of the gross domestic product uh, for these countries. So what we can see here is that, for example, in Tanzania, lending from China is very small. It's not significant at all. And FDI from China is also very small. Contracting is larger. Um, it's about the same as in Zimbabwe and Kenya. But the Chinese loans are not paying for those contracts. That means that other entities are paying for them. I don't know who. Zambia, on the other hand, the Chinese lending is very large. The FDI is also substantial and the contracting relationship is huge in terms of percentage of GDP. Uh, Zimbabwe is more moderate uh, on both, but there's a substantial amount of FDI going into the mineral sector. Kenya, the FDI is low. Um, the contracting relationship is a little bit higher and then the loans again, are, in terms of a percentage of GDP, it's pretty modest. So Zambia is the one that stands out here. And these are, um, again, just to look more closely at the sectors that the Chinese are lending into in these countries. 
In Zimbabwe, um, you can see down here that we'll start with transport at the bottom. Uh, well, let's look over at Kenya. So Kenya is the standard gauge railway that's the bulk of that. It's about $5 billion for the uh, two phases of it so far. Uh, Zambia is mostly roads, the transport and airports fit into these as well. And then electric power. So the red um, bars here are for electric power. And it's interesting in Zimbabwe, Tanzania and Kenya, the share going into electric power is almost identical in terms of the absolute value. Zambia is a lot higher. Uh, they've had more hydropower projects um, funded by Chinese entities. I was going to share uh, where this comes from, um, and maybe I'll do that in the Q&A because all of this data, I can just, let me see if I can give you a quick, yeah. So this is the China to Africa loans database that Boston University is hosting. And I got the data here. It's a really fun thing. You can go to Kenya, you can click on that. You can get all of the loans in the different sectors there, or here's, um, Tanzania, we've got Zimbabwe there, and uh, here's Zambia. And then you can scroll down and all the four countries that I pulled out here, you can look at the, all the, po the projects that are funded by the Chinese. So all of these were funded uh, by China and Zambia. You can look at the ones in Zimbabwe and uh, you can do this for all the different sectors like transport and again, clicking on it, the number of loans, the value. So I'm gonna stop there. And I look forward to everybody else's. And I hope I hope I haven't talked too long. Thanks, captivating stuff, uh, Deborah. Captivating stuff. The tables are most illuminating, and I think it's very educate, educational for some for many of us. Uh, we have tended to generalize this subject, um, and I really thank you indeed for what you have done so far in this discussion. I. I'm fascinated by the figures. I mean, the construction, for example, 50 billion. Um, it's massive. And the difference, the comparison uh, in terms of uh, uh, lending between Zimbabwe and Kenya were the same, you know, uh, different results. We'll, we'll come to question time. We really want to know why Angola and Zambia stand out so, so, uh, glaringly yeah, but the point you made about the fragmented and hopeless nature of chinese uh, investment in eastern and southern africa is most most startling so let's move straight to to uh, gilead terry uh, because we want to have a discussion as soon as possible about to lead by our discussions because Deborah is to leave us at seven o'clock, so we'll take advantage of us. So, Gilead, please. Thank you. Let me try to share my screen. Um, uh, you can see it. Great. Just a second. Uh, just a second. You're muted, Gilead. Great. Um, yeah. So thank thank you very much uh, for the um, uh, for the opportunity. And I wanted to. I'm trying. I'm trying to figure out. Just a second. Let me just try to reshare it. Lost your screen. Elliot, it was looking great before we could see it. Fantastic. So um, the, the angle that I'm trying to approach this subject on is part of uh, an ongoing research project that I have here at the University of Manchester. And as Professor Ibo mentioned, it's about the political economy of infrastructure development um, um, in the global south. Uh, and um, taking um, an entry point of great power competition and what 
hedging strategies um, our states are using to navigate uh, this increasingly complex uh, relation. And China is quite central to this question. So China and Africa relations um, is certainly um, uh, an area of interest and I'm taking lessons um, uh, from, from East Africa. Yeah, let me try to move to my next slide. Perfect, perfect. So the uh, argument that I'm advancing is that uh, in a new Cold War world, um, African states are forced to hedge between great powers to achieve their development um, objective. Uh, and what I'm trying to um, um, say here is that uh, infrastructure, as we have noticed uh, from the previous presentation, which is a huge chunk of investments happening, not only from global powers, but also from domestic um, uh, act, state actors, are becoming fields of great power competition. And states are being forced to use various mediation, uh, mediating uh, strategies to hedge between these uh, global powers. Uh, and I will try to also touch on what implications are there, uh, some of the ongoing debates, as well as um, uh, the way forward. Now, the argument um, that I'm making on this particular research is that China is changing um, as, as part of this uh, uh, major actor within, within, uh, within Africa. Uh, and some of the changes that are happening are that first, it is orienting to become a high income country. So it is changing uh, the value chains within, um, uh, within, uh, within its country uh, with an objective um, of aspiring to become, uh, to, to, move, to move up the value chain from, from, a, uh, from a low income country to a middle income country. And, it, and in so doing, it's entering and competing into value chains that, um, that are putting it on a collision course um, with the US and Western uh, uh, neoliberal order. Uh, and I think Ho Fang uh, Hung has really written quite extensively on this. His recent book in 2022 is, is called uh, The Clash of Empires. He talks about all these areas where we're seeing um, uh, competition and challenges between US and China, including technology as well as, as other areas. So that is one way that um, China uh, uh, is changing uh, as, as a global actor. Secondly, in so doing, it's also tweaking its global reach to support uh, Chinese lead firms. Uh, and what I'm saying here is that it's the relations that China used to have with the world, including Africa in the 90s, uh, in the early 2000s, prior to 2008, are significantly changing to the kind of relations that China is having now. Uh, uh, Tim Zayont has written a very interesting article where he calls the Chinese of these days, which are quite different from the Chinese um, uh, uh, previously. And here, uh, Shindla is advancing an argument that um, uh, China is now using infrastructure to try to control the network of resource frontiers, where resource come from, all the areas where uh, transport is happening, all the way to uh, connecting it to zones of exports uh, like ports and, and orienting them uh, to support the Chinese lead firms. Um, and this has been um, um, uh, emerging as part of, uh, part of discussion of global China at the moment. I think Doshi has moved this argument completely to, uh, to the far end, uh, saying that China is trying to project a global geopolitical ambition and to replace uh, the US as, um, uh, as, as a leading uh, global hegemonic actor. On the other side, Africa is also changing. I think Chi Kwon Lee has um, done a marvelous uh, job in trying to also showcase how African actors are becoming much more assertive in terms of defining and pursuing their own objective. But also, um, you know, recent studies are, are showing that there is a lot of middle level contestation that is happening that on one side, it's improving competition and agency uh, within the African context. So China as a major actor in the continent fits quite um, um, uh, in this, uh, you know, has to, has to navigate within this uh, complex geopolitical realities. And this is the context that my research um, uh, is situated on. Now, the new Cold War, uh, where am I coming um, um, uh, from with this particular, uh, with this particular uh, context? Around 2008, you see a lot of increase uh, in Chinese assertiveness and mainly because of the global financial crisis. There's this you know, symbolism that uh, it implies the decline of America as a leading hegemonic power. And you have China being able to weather that storm much more effectively, you know, unleashing all these massive investments in infrastructure domestically and 
being able to weather that storm and becoming a much more assertive global power. You see a lot of uh, Chinese advances within um, uh, global institutions, uh, including the World Bank, which I had the privilege uh, of working at at that particular time. So I think this particular assertiveness and this particular confidence that China brought to the world system put a bit um, uh, of America on the back foot. And you also see following that, uh, following about, uh, President Obama's re-election in 2012, a new strategy emanating, which had started certainly shaping up around 2011 uh, with pivot to Asia, understanding that the Pacific is now becoming an area of uh, increasing strategic concern and US marshals up its uh, geostrategic uh, competition to contain China. Uh, you know, at the same time, the, uh, the narratives of Cold War kept being invoked uh, that China feels like encircled uh, with uh, US and its Pacific allies and Belt and Road Initiative was its response uh, to, um, you know, against the, the Western encirclement. And then from that point in time, uh, China uh, put uh, to use infrastructure as a tool to reshape not only geographic locations, patterns, uh, networks of flows all over the world. And infrastructure moves from just being a service that um, uh, uh, a state provides to its economy to become a tool of geopolitical ambition and geopolitical advances. And it just changes in so many ways, which I'll try to touch on uh, uh, the following slide. And from the Belt and Road Initiative, you see consistent efforts, not only from the US, but also its Western ally to come up with responses uh, uh, through infrastructure. So the Global Gateway Initiative, which has, you know, was inaugurated last year uh, with the European um, uh, Union uh, pledges of, our, uh, of, our, of our 300 billion uh, euros in investment, uh, B3Ws, which has also currently been tweaked tweaked as a, a, a partnership for global infrastructure investment through the G7 summit that has just concluded in Madrid. Now, again, uh, through this context, this is where my argument is, is sitting, that African countries are increasingly compelled uh, to live in this competitive global power and trying to find ways to hedge between them to achieve their objective. Now, the area that I've looked into is mostly in Eastern Africa, and this is just a, print, a, a blueprint that was um, put forward by Oxford Analytica that just showcases the kind of infrastructure investment that are happening within um, uh, the Eastern African coast. So, you know, you have not only the LAP set, um, the, 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 the Kenyan uh, uh, standard gauge railway, you have the Tanzanian one, and there's a lot of conversation about going all the way to, um, uh, to Eastern Congo. And I think one thing that you're also realizing that I'll come at the end of this presentation is that all road, all of these roads sort of lead to um, uh, areas of resource frontiers, which, um, uh, which are Eastern Congo. Um, and um, in this particular talk, I'll just focus on two particular infrastructure investment, uh, the Kenyan SGR uh, railway, as well as the Tanzanian one. Though in my research program, I'm keen to look at areas beyond that. I mean, in a, a case like Kenya, provides a huge and a fascinating um, uh, case for uh, uh, infrastructure research, trying to see what China is doing as a Chinese actor, which I'll touch upon in, uh, in a few slides from here. So one of the things that I'm finding out is that um, infrastructure network are, are increasingly become uh, fields of competition between China and other actors. So you have, again, as I mentioned, this global infrastructure program, the DRI, the B3W, as well as the uh, Global Gateway um, Initiative. The big question that I think in a lot of discourse that we have not asked is as to why there is huge interest uh, by global powers um, on infrastructure development. So I identify uh, three reasons. Uh, the first reason uh, is what uh, Professor Hang has identified as a crisis of accumulation and he's building on uh, conversations from, uh, from Max uh, as well as Giovanni Arigi, which says that an economy sort of changes its behavior when profits starts to decline within, uh, within its, uh, within its uh, geographic location. And what eventually happens is that they try to find zones outside their own geographic locations to um, valorize their capital, to make sure that they're able to find areas of investment uh, where they can, uh, they can recoup their profits uh, much higher. Max said that when capital leaves a certain location, it's not because it prefers uh, an outsider. Um, um, 
environment, it simply moves to an area where it can get higher returns. So we are seeing a lot of um, foreign um, reserve back during the time of commodity boom and you know um, uh, export um, export led growth that China experienced, sitting on trillions of reserves. So one way to um, safely hedge uh, as well as uh, reduce the risk domestically is to pump some of these uh, funds into infrastructure investment and then collect uh, the amounts that you can get in terms of debt repayment for, for a longer period of time. So this is one of the area that China has increasingly invested on over the last couple of years. Now, on the US side, there's a, you know, a similar kind of crisis, but certainly not from the state led kind of accumulation that China is leading. This is more on private sector uh, kind of uh, a liquidity glut. And what they have done on the other side is what uh, Tom Goodfellow has called financialization of infrastructure, where now infrastructure are uh, being designed through complex uh, modalities and complex uh, financial arrangements in a way that they become um, zones of uh, profit making. And, uh, and the World Bank study from, uh, from 2010 identified infrastructure as one of the premier areas where you can put your money in and get a higher return. And I think this also fuels part of the, um, part of the global movement towards uh, investment on, infra on infrastructure. And, and the last uh, reason that I try to earmark here is what Schindler called um, sort of infrastructure arms race, which I mentioned earlier on, where you use infrastructure as a means to control zones of extraction as well as access to markets. And, uh, and I'm happy to talk about it further um, um, uh, in, in, some, in some, of the, um, some of the interviews. One, one uh, expert that I spoke in one of the interviews said something qu quite interesting that, you know, from, from DRC, there's just a lot of transport uh, zones from, you know, towards different sides. So you have the Northern Corridor in Kenya, you have uh, the Central Corridor, you have the Tazara zone, you have the Walvish Bay, you have the Durban, um, and all these are just, you know, zones where um, uh, zones of flows that uh, that uh, some of these great powers are trying are trying to control and reorient them towards towards their own uh, their own lead firms. Now, the, the other thing that I found is that you know African policymakers are you know developing quite complex uh, hedging strategies, and you know as as this is an ongoing research, um, I have I have tried to group them much more broadly on diversification strategies, competitive strategies, and distributive strategies. I'll just touch on those three, uh, three slides and I'll be out of your way. So with respect to div diversification is that countries now are able to use resources that traditionally were not, uh, were not available. So because of, because of uh, the flows that are increasingly coming, not only from China, but also from other middle powers, it's altering the political structure, it's offering uh, elites opportunities to dis and also disrupt uh, some political settlements. I think Dobler has written a very interesting case of Namibia, where there is sort of an alliance between a certain fraction of elites with all these uh, foreign uh, flowing um, uh, funds, which really uh, alters, um, alters the, uh, the political uh, settlements within, within the country. Uh, there is also a divergence of development financing as we have seen uh, you know, previously, you know, there was huge um, uh, traditional, um, a huge uh, volume of traditional uh, Western funding, mainly through you know, the World Bank and international financial institutions. But now there's, a, there's more of you know, human development focus from all these traditional actors and where you have emerging actors willing to go into spaces like infrastructure, energy, extractives, um, uh, among others. Um, some countries have also tried to have a bit of a mixture of partners in some of the large scale projects. So for example, Tanzania uh, recently has allocated one of its lot instead of having a one, um, uh, 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 you know, a one railway network built by one partner. They have tried to introduce um, uh, to diversify by using by using China as a separate um, as a separate uh, uh, contractor. And they have got the last uh, the last lot of uh, 249 kilometers. So this is just one of the um, the map that shows uh, uh, the diversification that Tanzania has done uh, with its uh, with its railway um, uh, construction uh, strategy. On the other side, you have uh, some states also opting for a competitive and open and open access one. Uh, here, countries decide to have to create an open uh, uh, platform. And in a way, it's trying to reenact uh, what was uh, the non-aligned uh, sort of uh, uh, sort of logic back then, 
where um, you know you pull you expect to pull in actors uh, to compete you know it's saying you know we are neutral we are an open field we you know we will use uh, uh, institutions to create this uh, sense of political uh, fairness uh, railway development authorities take charge you have a bit less of uh, uh, of political inter interference and you find this quite different from how sort of the staging engagements happen with the Kenyan uh, standard gauge railway compared to you know how it is happening with uh, with the Tanzanian one where you know have all this competitive tendering process and so forth um, the last one is what I call distributive and this this is um, it's, it's one of the areas that I'm still developing. But I think Kenya provides a very interesting, uh, interesting case. You have they had in a very short space of time over the last couple of years uh, visits from three presidents, uh, from Xi Jinping, President Xi Jinping, Emmanuel Macron, as well as, as Barack Obama. And at the end of the day, all um, one, one of the things that each of the president did when they went to Kenya is to sign a deal on a construction um, uh, on a construction uh, to to oversee the construction of a uh, a signing of a construction a construction deal. So um, Manuel Macron was also part, you know, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, was there when there was a signing of a, of a highway that was was uh, will be built from Nairobi. I think they've already broken ground from Nairobi to uh, Rironi all the way to Mount Summit. Uh, and this again is a private uh, public partnership. Uh, it is said to be part of the Global Gateway Initiative. It's funded by the uh, Meridian Infrastructure Fund. Uh, and constructed by a French firm called Vinci Construction. And you know, when President Obama visited uh, Nairobi, they also signed uh, an MOU with uh, Bechtel uh, Corporation to build uh, the Mombasa uh, Nairobi uh, uh, Highway, which hasn't broken uh, ha hasn't broken ground yet. And I'll talk to some of the risks that um, are associated with some of these strategies. So in this particular strategy, you see territorial actors, mainly states, taking the active lead in identifying, incentivizing, as well as guaranteeing uh, 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 some of these deals. Uh, now, uh, the implication is that some risks also still exist despite uh, trying, to, uh, trying to have these strategies. So for example, when uh, Tanzania tried to play these great powers now to say, okay, we're gonna open the, you know, the tender process, we're gonna be just the Chinese firm that was um, uh, uh, sort of Single sourced back then, or you know, was was uh, shortlisted back then in the in the, in the tender process. We just going to reopen. Uh, Chinese firms did buy uh, the the tender process, but during the submission, all of them did not uh, did not um, uh, return their bids. And this is how Tanzania ended up uh, sort of giving that first couple of lots to to a Turkish firm. So again, again, what we are seeing is that. When, when, when global powers are also, when, when, when uh, African countries are also trying to sort of find their way to, to, to get a better deal, you also have uh, strategies on the other side of great powers to see how to manage those, uh, those processes as well. And some lessons, um, some, on a more positive note, is that some, some lessons that, that work with respect to open access they are also uh, adopted with, uh, with actors on, uh, on the ground. Uh, and one thing I've, I've, I've heard quite recently on an interview is that um, you know, competitive and open access has gone beyond construction in, into operations of this infrastructure. And then one, of my, uh, one of my respondents who is quite privy to, uh, to the infrastructure sector in East Africa said that the Tazara Railway, I think for the first time uh, over the last two, three years, they've been able to make money enough to pay the salaries of their own, their own staff through a collaboration with a South African operator called Calabash. So this is, you have a private operator using, uh, using an, an infrastructure, an infrastructure that was, uh, that was built uh, by, uh, by traditional, by, by the government of traditional actors. Uh, last but not least in some instances, also placing political processes ahead of businesses can lead to an impasse. Uh, and this is what you have with the Bechtel Corporation uh, uh, in Kenya, where they say, um, you know, we haven't, uh, you know, we have, we did not agree to some of Yeah, we, we haven't, we haven't agreed to some of the details of, uh, 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 you know, that were agreed during the political process uh, with respect to the, to the Nairobi uh, Mombasa Highway. So uh, I'll just finish now um, that, I mean, the presence of 
you know, China certainly as an actor uh, impacts the political opportunity structure and, 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 you know, and also through access to resources that were previously unavailable. And this is also something that is increasingly happening uh, with other middle powers. But also there is a perception of risk um, increasingly by, uh, by other, uh, by African policymakers of being locked in sort of a core periphery um, uh, uh, relations. And I think the big question that we, we ought to ask ourselves when we're having these discussions comparing Eastern Africa and Southern Africa, be it extractives and be it transport infrastructure. Uh, the fundamental question is that are any of these investments be it by Chinese or other actors changing fundamentally how Africa interacts or integrates with the world system? Because at the end of the day, I think both ends up being, you know, quite extractive oriented. And I'll just try to sort of cement that point with something that I heard in my in one of my interviews, where an expert said that, well, we are surveying the Central Corridor Railway in Tanzania, trying to see all the infrastructure there and see how we can support uh, its its revitalization prior to the decision of building a new SGR. And and we found some infrastructure within that railway that dated 1900 when it was built by the Germans. And he said something that really struck me. It was the same route that was used through the self trade. The German used it to build a private railway. The post-colonial Tanzanian government built a central railway. And now it's part of the Chinese built um, a new uh, central, uh, central, corridor, central corridor railway. So the fundamental question remains does it really change, um, you know, all these all these influx where it's infrastructure, where in transportation, does it really change the fundamental way that Africa, or at least this part of the world, Eastern and Southern Africa, uh, interact with the global system? Thank you very much, Professor. I'll, I'll pause there. Thanks, Gilead. Thanks very much. Very very detailed stuff. I'm particularly fascinated by the. The, 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 the issue, the reference, the clash of empires uh, and what informs investment in Africa, the crisis of accumulation, uh, uh, hopping on Marx and one of our former teachers, Giovanni Arigi, you know, work on in Zimbabwe, and in particular his seminal piece on the political economy of Rhodesia, um, financialization of infrastructure. The point you made in Dar es Salaam that uh, one of the one of the uh, uh, motivations behind Chinese investment is polarization of surplus, and thirdly, competition for control of zones of extraction and markets. Again, it reminds me of Cecil John Rhodes' statement in 1858 that uh, that if you want to avoid revolution in England. You need to become colonialists in, uh, in pursuit of raw materials to feed the factories at home. And uh, markets uh, to which to sell finished products. And the question, of course, is has anything changed now? And is there any, any, any difference in the nature and content of investment between the West and the East? These are some of the questions that I hope we our discussants can raise. And please, after the discussant, uh, Chennai, I would like any of our participants to raise their hands and make a contribution as they wish. Chennai. Thanks, Abel. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and highlight to um, Deborah and Gillian, possibly something that they already know, but I'm gonna, gonna use three case studies in Zimbabwe, just to try and highlight what, um, how China's lending, what it looks like in Zimbabwe, and kind of the implications in terms of um, that kind of bilateral, bilateral um, debt, as some would call it, the debt trap diplomacy. What does this look like? And perhaps try and answer a little bit, Ivo, of how we are seeing these uh, variations in development, in spite of the fact that other countries are borrowing from China and perhaps are looking better in terms of their infrastructure development. So, as I said, I'll look at these three case studies, but just to come back to on Deborah's um, figures, just to say, Deborah, 
Thank you so much for the work that you guys are doing at John Hopkins and the Boston University data sets, because these are really proved invaluable to us when we're trying to understand what is going on in Zimbabwe, because as you know, much of China's lending is shrouded in smokes and mirrors. It's very hard to understand who is being lent what, what are the terms and conditions of each kind of um, debt loan structure that's coming out of China into the different um, entities. So the data sets have, have, have proved really, really useful. Please do take that feedback um, back to your team. So what do we have? So I'll look at um, two specific um, case studies within the diamond um, sector. I'm sure we've all heard of AFEC. I'll do a little bit of a walkthrough to understand how the China Exim Bank, which currently in the last public debt statement, it was, um, I think over 50% of our public borrowing is, is from China Exim Bank and Sinoshore. So this excludes other lending that we have had access to through the China Development Bank, through the Bank of China, other interests like Sino Hydro um, or the Ind Industrial and Commercial Bank of China, all of whom have interest in Zimbabwe. This is not um, listed in our public debt statement. However, just looking at this AFIC um, case studies, I hope to highlight um, the big elephant in the room around, are these loans resource backed? Are we giving up equity in exchange of um, China lending? And why are we not seeing the direct development from this kind of long arm of um, help that we're getting um, from China as it were? So to look at AFEC, so AFEC in 2009, AFEC was given 50% equity in an enterprise or a company called Agin which has concessionary rights in the in Marange, in the Chiadwa diamond mining. So this 50% equity was then exchanged for construction of the National Defense College. So AFEC then go ahead and borrow from China Exim Bank 98 million US dollars to construct the National Defense College. So we are seeing some sort of equity relationship between the lending and uh, the, the infrastructure development. So, so if you just pay attention to that, because that's important. AFEC then go ahead and borrow an additional 225 million from China Development Bank. This then allows them to fund, um, sorry, operations in Chiazwa. A 2016 report. So here we have 225 million being borrowed from China Development Bank by AFEC, which is a Chinese um, ent entity, but this is, this is for the purposes of diamond operations in Chiazwa. In 2016, a report is then released to say, okay, so AFEC has been um, in Marange, we have been mining, however, we've not really had any payment back to Zimbabwe on royalties, taxation, et cetera, et cetera. And I think at that point, the government um, at the time decides to, to, to take away the concessionary rights for AFEC and continue um, using the Zimbabwe Consolidation Diamond Mining. And this kind of puts AFEC in a default position, which is the first risk structure that we see the, the way that Zimbabwe's equity, the way that Zimbabwe's resources can be exposed to Chinese um, lending. So once they're on the default list, um, with China Development Bank and with the Chinese Exim Bank, this does put Zimbabwe at risk. However, in 2018, there are new, in April, new bilateral agreements where AFIC is returned the concessionary rights to continue mining in Chiadwa. And in addition, as a goodwill gesture, two billion contract is awarded to them for the Chirundu Highway, Highway um, Bite Bridge. So what does this tell us in terms of the risk exposure, in terms of equity-based, um, and resource-based loan. AFEC is a high-risk Chinese entity. Currently, its parent company is bankrupt. And so the, the situation that it may go default is not far-fetched to think so. If this happens, it poses a direct risk on the equity holdings that AFEC has in Zimbabwe, one of which is the, is the partnership or the joint venture agreement with in Ajin, which is the currently in um, Chiazwa doing the diamond mining. But also we know the Longsheng Plaza, we all know the, um, the Mutare Hotel and so many others, some of which you know, I personally don't know of, but suspect that they are. So these are some of the risks that 
Chinese lending brings um, to Zimbabwe that go past even this um, present generation. Another um, example of how Chinese lend lending sort of manifests in commercial enterprise and commercial partnership is we can have a look at the Sino Hydro Wange Colliery. So what we have is a 1 billion loan that China Exim Bank has given to Zimbabwe, specific to the development of Wange Colliery Unit 7 and 8. This 1.1 billion is insufficient to then pay up for the contract that we award to Sino Hydro, which is a completely state-owned Chinese contracting um, company. So we give them 1.5 billion. So Zimbabwe raises um, through its own resources and other loans, not 0.5 billion to meet um, this contract. The 1.1 billion we get from Chinese Exim loan includes 80% concessionary at 2% interest and 20%, sorry, 80% concessionary, yes, and 20% non-concessionary. So we are paying commercial rates on 20% of 1.1 billion. But I mean, it's not clear how much that is, but it is um, stated that it is non-concessionary. So this is another example wherein we've got a commercial partnership that is backed by that infrastructure frontier loan that I think Gilead was uh, made reference to that's coming through China Exim Bank, but is being awarded to a Chinese state-owned um, enterprise. So what is the risk to Zimbabwe? The risk to Zimbabwe is the cost of a 1 billion loan. So we have to repay the, the principal. I think we have a 20 year um, extension on the loan. We have to pay the interest, which is we know for the bulk of it is it's 2% and the remainder on 20%. We don't know what other commercial terms and conditions are associated with the 20%. We are awarding that that 1 billion is being paid back to China to sign a hydro. If not paid after 20 years, we're not sure what the terms are. Again, we have seen through the public debt statement that was issued that other borrowing that is meant for other projects. So for example, the India Exim um, loan that was borrowed for the DECA project, that is re-diverted and is being used to pay some of the China Exim loan that was used for Wange Colliery. And this is um, stated in the public debt statement. The other way that we see um, Chinese lending manifesting in Zimbabwe is affiliation to resource extraction. So what having the uh, China, so as I've said at the start, China Exim Bank, currently our public borrowing is at 50% of our public borrowing is from China Exim Bank. So this does give them a great foot in the door in terms of um, bilateral diplomacy, et cetera, et cetera. It gives um, an in, as it were, in terms of negotiating of um, commercial deals. And we have seen some of these commercial deals that do not entirely benefit um, Zimbabwe, in specifically in the long run. One such is the Zimasco, which is currently owned by Sino Steel. Um, trying to find how much Sino Steel purchased Zimasco for is, is like looking for a needle in a haystack. But the first time I find something, it states that it was acquired for 200 million US dollars. Now imagine the fifth largest ferrochrome deposit sold for 200 US million dollars. We know in um, also trying to even understand the revenue in itself is another needle in, a, in the haystack. But I have managed to see that at least in 2011, Zemasco had a revenue of 194.9 million. That's in one year. And yet that's the value that it was acquired for. So how do we look at this from a, from a whole life cost, from a return on investment? How do we align the debt that uh, China is so kindly giving to Zimbabwe vis-a-vis -vis the Chinese interest in Zimbabwe and their association with resources in Zimbabwe, with equity um, in Zimbabwe? I mean, there are so many other deals um, that that we we have seen that we are able to find um information on i mean the list goes on um we have um us 20 million dollars to the infrastructure development bank which was given from china from the china development bank which we know is non-concessionary so the infrastructure development bank of zimbabwe was given 20 million 
this is not really, it's not included in the public debt statement as far as I can tell, is not included in the loans from China Exim Bank. We don't know what this was attached to because on paper is recorded as being for the use of working capital. So what does that mean in terms of the Infrastructure Development Bank of Zimbabwe? To what extent have we, what have we given in exchange um, of that borrowing? Um, we have um, for, for um, parliament, I know we had a grant aid, a hundred million dollar grant aid for, for a very beautiful um, uh, <laughs> or Pali house in Mount Hamden, not really sure, you know, how that um, fits where we need hospitals, etc. So without even going into the, the finer detail of then what are the political nuances? What is the impact on the democracy agenda for Zimbabwe of this kind of friendly lending that we get, this free lending that we get from China? The other thing to pay attention to as well is the fact that a lot of the Chinese bank loans are very liquid. So they will issue loans to um, Chinese interests that want to, to uh, acquire resources in Zimbabwe very easily. But what happens then is with those interests, if they are to go into default, that extends, that puts at risk the Zimbabwean resources, the Zimbabwe equity shares that are attached or assigned to those um, companies that are borrowing from China. So these are all some of the other things that I think specific to Zimbabwe, perhaps more so than elsewhere, though I doubt that. I have had a look at, for example, Angola. We have seen a lot of military involvement in the Congo from China, et cetera, as well. So it's almost as though we have this long arm that comes in through the China Exim Bank. It has concessionary loans. They are long-term. The interest rates are low. But what that gives is that debt trap diplomacy begins. And that will introduce other, you follow through the Chinese development loans, Sino Hydro, um, the uh, Industrial Bank of China, et cetera, et cetera. You, there's so many that you follow through and see how their interest has also expanded from the time that um, China, Chinese lending through the China Exim Bank um, increased. So I think that's the spanner that I would like to throw in the works in terms of that debt trap diplomacy. Yes, we have lending. Yes, if you speak to China Exim Bank, they'll tell you that it's not resource backed, it's not equity backed, et cetera. But when you start to look at the whole um, web of relationship that starts with a Chinese loan from the China Exim Bank, this is where you're going to get a lot of nuances around the resources that have been transferred to China, the risks that Zimbabwe is taking on, how it's going to impact us even for generations to come potentially. And yeah, I think I will leave it there for now, Ibo. Thanks. Thanks very much. I'm hoping that there are uh, our Chinese guests from the Zimbabwe embassy, the Chinese embassy in Zimbabwe. And we are of course welcome to, to contribute and also to debate the issues that Chennai has put on the table with regard to Chinese investment in, uh, in, in Zimbabwe, and including the allegations that were one of the causes, uh, re the reasons for the coup in 2017 was the Anjin issue, um, a report produced for Mugabe on the basis of which he, uh, Anjin was thrown out in 2016. We should remember that. And then Jin came back after the coup. It's, uh, it's a matter that maybe uh, Chennai would like to reflect upon later, but I think it's something that needs to be put on the table too. Um, yeah. I noticed that people here who may want to uh, speak, people like uh, Gordon Moyo, uh, who has been doing some research on China's Zimbabwe relations. And indeed, anybody else, please go to like to come in Chennai. Would you like to come in? Yes, I mean, you raise a very good point around the, 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 the coup and the relationship because what actually happened is once we had um, APEC in Zimbabwe with the partnership with Angin, in 2016, this is when we get the report that says there's no royalties, taxation, etc. And Mugabe pulls that out. When APEC is now in trouble, 
China then withholds some of their commitments to Zimbabwe through the China Exim Bank, the Wange Colliery being one. So they withhold the uh, disbursements of some of those loans. But what we see in April 2018 is a new agreement that happens with the Second Republic and the Prime Minister in China. <coughs> and this then um, regenerates AFEC by giving them the 2.5 billion Turundu Bay Bridge Highway um, contract, which was actually awarded to someone else. And then also they have given back their concessionary rights in Chiadwa. And it is at that point that the Wange Collier Remind uh, 1.1 billion loan is disbursed as well. So th th this is, this is uh, all, it's, it's all down on paper. It's not something I'm making up. Um, yeah, so this is how it happened in summary. We'll come back to that. So Femi and then Christopher Mulenga. Femi first. Femi. Yeah, sorry, I had my uh, mic muted. Can you hear me now? Yes, can you hear you? Yes, yes, thank you. Um, yeah, it's, it's, yeah, it's wonderful to hear all of this and, and depressing all in equal measure. Um, Where are you calling from? I'm calling from Tanzania. I'm in Dar es Salaam at the moment. Um, oh, one wow. of the things that's really, I suppose, it, it's the same old story. And, and, you know, we've been discussing these things for, I think, as many have said, for, for, for donkey's years. We, we have the African continental free trade area. We know it's not perfect, but it, it's certainly a, a, a really significant a symbolic, uh, um, you know, statement uh, and yet everything still seems external everything seems still to be flowing outwardly uh, we know we've seen the figures of where you know continents or where blocks actually grow so much more when there's internal trade when there's internal uh, you know exchanges and um, what, what's happening for, from you know our experts point of views in terms of the growth, the, the internal growth of our markets. Are, are the roads literally going to the ports or are they um, now converging inwards? Thanks, Femi. Uh, I'll be asking the, the panelists to come back. But in the meantime, Christopher Mulenga, please. Christopher Mulenga. Um, uh, good evening. Um, can you hear me? Yes, can hear you now. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm I'm calling from Zambia. Um, I, 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 sorry. We want your guru. I did win over. Yeah. I I like to echo a lot of what uh, Chennai said. Uh, about the experience with the Chinese um, um, so-called uh, help to our um, uh, Africa in our country in particular. Uh, in Zambia, we've just had um, a regime change from one government to the other. Uh, and the other government, um, uh, the previous government is really in trouble in having to account for so many dismeanors uh, and uh, so many crooked things they did with the Chinese. And some Chinese contracts are now being canceled here and there, and they're in real trouble because some contracts are halfway done. You see, what our exp experience with our Chinese is that they, they come in saying, oh, our aid is not like the West, where there are conditionalities. For us, we don't care what you do in your own country, it's none of our business. As long as we advance our agenda and we support you for everything is okay. But where it's not okay for us, as we found out, is that they don't have ethics. They corrupt politicians openly. For them, gifts in form of briefcases full of dollars was the order of the day here. And that really went to a very, very reckless level that some people even bought 
helicopters, not one, but two, parked in their farms. You know, so you, you wind up what type of aid this is. And then when it comes to doing infrastructure, their quotations for roads were so exaggerated, even for buildings and other um, different forms of support. You know, but we were being told that they've had to allow for uh, the kickbacks, but kickbacks were not going to come to a, to an extent where one of the roads, which was stopped by public outcry, which was three times the cost of industry um, norm or comparison in the whole region. So these people, Chinese, they have to be managed. I think their aid uh, could be of some use, but it can only be of some use if the government is responsible and able to check on them. Another issue we found very, very um, difficult to, to, to digest. Africa has a problem of um, labor jobs for the general workers. But when these Chinese come with their construction companies, they come with their own laborers. Now, you know, we need jobs for the, these builders who are out of employment and the laborers, uh, you know, site workers. But these guys come with their own. These are not investors. Some of them, I, get, I, I went to school in um, Nigeria and my friends call me in the middle of the night scolding me. They said, Chris, don't you guys know how to roast maize? It starts off simply like that. Then I say, of course we do. Then they say, but why do you have Chinese on the roadside roasting maize for you? So what type of investor is that? Now to come to Zambia and to have investor status, you need to bring in half a million dollars, okay? But these guys are staying in shanty compounds, impregnating young girls and having children who can't be taken back to China. That's one. Two, these guys are calling Africa their second continent. There are books written in that, to that, um, uh, you know, to attest to that. So, and when they come into our societies, they're not even friendly. You can't mix with them. They'll get a big tract of land and build houses in there and, and put up a big war fence and you can't even talk to them. You can't even go in there. So these guys are slowly but surely occupying Africa and never to go back. Okay, now in places like, for example, Mozambique, they build a very, very nice port there, harbor and everything. It'll be very brief. And they, I need to and get they to always, okay, and quickly. Yeah, quickly to allow others to talk. They like to lend you uh, even preferably when you can't pay back so that they foreclose and these things become theirs. So that is becoming very, very uh, despised. And that's why the previous government for us here got voted out overwhelmingly. So now we are back allowing other players from the West as well and other European countries to participate in development. Thank you so much. Thanks, Christopher. I, I'm sure the panelists, especially the two panelists, will, will respond to some of your, shall I call them allegations, or maybe exaggerate <laughs> reactions to the Chinese factor. I'll ask Eleanor to come in quickly, and then I'll ask uh, uh, Deborah to speak before she leaves. She has to leave very soon. Eleanor Sisulu, welcome. <laughs> <clears throat> Thank you very much for uh, fascinating presentations. Um, let me just put my video. Okay. Thank you for the presentations. And I just want to comment on, not on uh, China, but on us, on us Africans and on our gov governments, that we have data on China and Chinese relations with Africa been aggregated at John Hopkins University. And we are not doing this ourselves. We don't have data on ourselves. I mean, this is, this is the thing that you, I, I, I hear the anger 
of the previous uh, uh, previous speaker, but we are the ones that are responsible for for this. And I was interested when Femi talked about, or no, Gilead talked about hedging, how our uh, <clears throat> governments hedge, but do they do it in our interests? For example, we can't blame China for building a parliament in Zimbabwe, which is absolutely useless and unnecessary. It's, it's us who make those decisions. It's our governments who make those decisions. And those decisions are not in the interest of African people. So quite frankly, whether it's China or whether it's the West, uh, I think in both instances, we have governments which are not acting in our interests. And I won't even get into the area of human rights because that's a whole other area uh, where African interests are, or the interests of African people are just trampled underfoot. So I, I really think that, yes, we can criticize China, we can criticize the West too, but we really have to have our act, get our act together. Thank you. Thanks, Eleanor. Uh, uh, I'll now call on Deborah to respond where you can, mm -hmm. add where Hi, necessary. Evo. Hi, Evo, thanks. Um, it's been a very interesting discussion and it's really, a, uh, it's, how to put it, um, I really appreciate being here and being able to be part of this seminar here in Zimbabwe and sort of in the Southern Africa region. I think the I want to I think make two comments um, following on what some of the speakers have said, and the first is uh, about the issue of corruption and Chinese um, engagement. I think it's a real problem. It's something that I've uh, been pointing to for a long, long time. I think it's really the uh, the weak the weak point, the dark side of the Chinese engagement. I don't see, you know, things like asset seizures or the debt trap diplomacy in terms of the Chinese want to grab your your strategic assets, but I do see as as being the issue. I think that corruption is the issue, and it's because um, the Chinese companies are not restrained uh, by any institutional um, hold. There's there's in the countries where corruption is a problem here in Africa, they're not being restrained by local governments. And uh, they aren't being restrained by the Chinese government. Um, foreign corruption actually is illegal for Chinese companies to bribe uh, government officials overseas. It is against the Chinese law. The criminal code was revised around 2011, and that was made illegal, just as uh, the United States made it illegal in 1977, and European countries made it illegal in 1997. Up until that point, it wasn't illegal. It wasn't a crime for our companies to bribe uh, government officials overseas. They could just deduct it from their tax returns. But I think that putting the pressure on the Chinese to actually enforce that law, it's Article 60 in their criminal code. So in, it's, it's one of my campaigns, enforce Article 60. And let's see some examples of, of Xi Jinping's uh, anti-corruption campaign being carried overseas as well. So I think that would be a, a wonderful shift. And then the second uh, point that I would make uh, is, is following up on the last um, person, Eleanor, who commented uh, on what happens here with African governments and African agency. And in my, my travels and interviews, I have seen the problem of trust, uh, the broken trust between citizens and their governments here is, is so severe. It's why um, people in NGOs and amongst citizens and the media, they don't trust their governments when they finally do publish the debt um, statistics in a very detailed um, manner. It's still not trusted. And we saw this in Zambia, our own research in Zambia. We published our data on Chinese lending there, um, which showed it was over it was twice as much as the government had been accounting for. And then the government there published its own list, which was almost identical with ours. So we felt that we were helping with the transparency. But it is, it is a job uh, for you all here. I would love to ha have transferred. In fact, uh, some of our work is being transferred to Witts University in South Africa in Johannesburg. Um, but this, this, what I'm often told um, is that the China, Chinese are like uh, water in a way. They take the shape of the vessel that they're poured into. <laughs> so in the United States, the Chinese are not very corrupt. 
Uh, you don't hear allegations about Chinese companies bribing government officials. There are other issues, but that's not the issue. And so I'll just stop uh, with that point. Thanks. Thanks, thanks, Deborah. Are you leaving now? Deborah? I can be here for seven more minutes. Okay. One, one, one minute when you're leaving, I'd like to thank you uh, profusely for a fantastic job done. Uh, uh, Gordon Moyo, before I call on uh, Gordon Moyo, before I call on uh, Gilead, Gordon. Uh, thank you, Ibo. Um, I would like uh, Deborah to comment on my submission. Um, China benefited in the 1970s uh, from Japan through the resource for infrastructure uh, investments. Um, it's actually, China uh, benefited a lot, and the Japanese were among the first to, to introduce these um, resource-backed loans in some way. Uh, what is it that they did, Debra, uh, uh, that Africa is not doing uh, to benefit from the, the Japanese loans, which are similar to Chinese loans uh, offered to, to, to Africa today? Uh, that's my first uh, question. The question number two, um, and again, I would like uh, uh, maybe uh, Debra and Chennai to, 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 to offer some, some insights. Uh, over the past 20 years, two decades, we have seen a lot of, um, um, of uh, uh, decline in the levels of funding from the multilateral institutions, bilateral institutions, the traditional uh, financiers, um, uh, the decline in, in, in finance to infrastructure in Africa. Um, if we are to pull out, um, uh, or if China or Africans would to stop the Chinese finance coming into Africa. What would happen to our infrastructure development? I'm a critique of, uh, of Chinese funding. Uh, uh, don't take me wrong with this question. Um, I'm looking at the infrastructure, um, given the fact that a lot of, uh, uh, of funding is going to infrastructure from, from China and less is coming from the multilateral institutions, the, the traditional ones. What, what is your take on that? Okay, Deborah first, then I'll go to- Thanks, thanks. <laughs> thanks Gordon, that's a, that's a great question. Um, in the mid 1970s, when China was still uh, doing uh, the cultural revolution, there was a huge amount of instability. Um, the Japanese leaders and Chinese leaders came up with a, a, an agreement for a $10 billion line of credit that would come from Japan and it would be used to import goods and equipment and Japanese expertise to build infrastructure and develop natural resources in China. And that loan was secured with exports of coal and oil that were already going to Japan from Chinese state-owned companies. So that kind of resource-backed loan, um, it, it worked well in the beginning. Um, it, projects were undertaken and um, a number of them in the first few years were funded through this line of credit. And then what happened was that the Chinese decided that their economy was overheating and they couldn't actually afford to take out that much. Um, and so they basically put a cap on it. They never borrowed the full 10 billion. But I think the reason why, why this worked in that context was in 1978, I think when they signed that loan, China wasn't credit worthy. No international banks would lend to China. Um, the World Bank was not, they weren't a member. So they didn't have uh, the ability to access credit. And so in countries where the risks are high and creditors um, are not coming, lining up to just offer unsecured credits, uh, this kind of resource secured, or um, it's a, somehow having a, a collateral, um, collateralized lending can be very fruitful for African development. And I give the example, the one I like to give a lot is, is in um, Ghana, they use this structure for the buoy dam in 2006 or 2007. And they actually secured that loan with exports of cocoa beans, which were having a growing market in China. So um, the, the Ghana Cocoa Board 
um, linked up with a buyer inside China. And then that buyer paid for the cocoa beans and paid part of it into an escrow account with China Exim Bank, which was part of how they secured the Bui Dam in the years before Bui Dam was actually producing electricity, which were, were then uh, how they made the loan payments later on. So that was in the in the first part when the risks still looked very high. So I do, and that worked that worked very well in Ghana, and there haven't really been any complaints about it. So I think the important thing is having a government that's really taking out these loans for developmental purposes. There's, you know, you have an interesting structure with a defense college. It's it's structured very much in a very similar way, but do you really need a huge defense university here in Zimbabwe? for $100 million. I'm not sure that was the best use of a concessional loan from the Chinese, if that's what your government negotiated. Um, but it's it depends. The Chinese will fund a lot of different things because the China Export Bank, Export Import Bank, is their whole purpose is to support Chinese companies, the sale of Chinese goods and services overseas. That's what Exim Banks do. So um, let me just stop there. Thanks, Deborah. And thank you very much indeed. I hope we'll see you before you leave uh, Arare. Yeah, well, I'm leaving um, on Saturday. Is this, yeah, it's today, today's Thursday, right? <laughs> it's been so quick. But I want to say goodbye to everybody. Thank you so much. Uh, it was a pleasure being on a panel with you. And I'm sorry I have to go. <laughs> we'll try and get lunch tomorrow, Deborah. I'll phone you in the morning. Bye. Let's go to uh, Chennai, and then I'll go back to Femi. Chennai? Hi, thank you. So yeah, so very good question um, from, from Gordon there. So in terms of infrastructure support, yes, it's true that we get the infrastructure um, lending from China and does it help? And I think here we need to look at it from a cost benefit um, perspective. If you look at it and think, okay, so for instance, I mentioned the Sino Hydro deal for Wange Colliery where we get a billion from China but we pay back four or five times as much. We get a billion from China to pay to China. We pay interest to China. The same company has access to other um, contracts as well because of this one deal, it's a, it extends, et cetera, et cetera. So you start to think what in the long run is the cost of this lending? How does it um, fare when we compare it with actual private financing, you know? So you look at what we've done with Zimasco, where we sold it for, for the equivalent of one year's revenue, and we've so, sold um, the rights to um, the fifth largest ferrochrome deposit in the world. So I think for me, we need to start considering, we need to really look at things differently, understand what is our asset, look at what is our asset resource, how can we in, engage um, private sector finance, how can we derive the best from what we have? before we sell our souls for a song, basically, which is what we're doing with the Chinese lending. That debt trap diplomacy has opened up, opened us up to being plundered through these um, agreements. I mean, I, I was going to ask Deborah in terms of corruption. So in Zimbabwe, the corruption is a, is a lot more coveted. You know, it's not so obvious because what we are having is we have partnership deals between, for instance, defense personnel, and Chinese companies. So therefore that becomes a legal standing somewhat. You cannot necessarily go at it with the corruption um, figure. You can go at it with, in terms of ethics, in terms of how they operate, but it is a viable legal standing, you see? So we don't always see briefcases of money. We, we get into partnership, whether it's defense personnel or other state um, personnel get into partnership with Chinese companies. The Chinese companies bring the investments in terms of the cheap money that they can access through the Chinese banks in terms of operationalizing these deals. And so in terms of corruption, it's a really difficult one to go after because it's not so obvious. So what we need to do is revalue or reevaluate our engagement and our bilateral agreements with China altogether and actually see how much are we owed by China is the question rather than how much do we owe China. But does the state, our state have that capacity? Uh, it appears to me that uh, as uh, the point raised by Eleanor, that our states are on the, on the receiving end. They're so porous in terms of capacity uh, to, to, to interrogate uh, loans and, and, and packages. And uh, the kind of opaque 
nature of these loans and I mean, the public doesn't even know the extent of these loans. You know, uh, we hear about them and the, the people are shocked thereafter, but generally it goes on, you know, on and on. Uh, let me bring in Femi again, and then I want Gilead to come in. Gilead, you have enough time to respond to questions. Um, Thank you. Thank Femi. you for indulging me again. Um, yeah, in fact, the, the last discussion point about commodity-backed um, credit um, kind of regimes or, or arrangements is, is something that I'm particularly interested in and wanted to know if there was more on that. And I, of course, this is in respect of China, I understand, but I, I suppose most of our concerns uh, fall at, well, what are we doing within our four, 54 states to actually assist one another? Is there room for commodity-backed uh, exchange arrangements continentally. I mean, if we think of the expertise that exists within the continent, you know, from north, south, east, west, what is there on the ground? What are our kind of uh, expertise telling us about? Can we do, can the expertise that's in South Africa that may be needed in Nigeria, can, you know, how can we exchange on, on based on our commodities, you know, uh, oil rich country here, um, particular expertise in another area that's needed uh, in Nigeria, what kind of exchanges can be developed around uh, what we have in abundance, which is our commodities, which is our natural resources. So if we could, because of course, dealing with China and, and the eels, I don't think any of those countries will ever do things differently. It's part of how you stay powerful. Now it's uh, how does Africa regenerate? And what, what are we doing within the continent? to ensure that we have the means to circulate what we have. Asante, Femi. Uh, Tony? Karibu. Asante. Tony? Thank you. Um, one of the things that strikes me about this is to go back to a very uh, interesting SAPIS dialogue many years ago about extractive industries when Claude Kabembe outlined what was going on with extractive industries. And he pointed out that uh, when it came to extractive industries, there were many fronts and many people behind the fronts. And he made the comment that I thought was really interesting, that he thought the most aggressive exploiters of extractive industries were actually South African companies in one way or another. But the most striking point he made was that if you looked at the difference between trying to do business in China and you wanted to do business in Africa, when you went to China, you got an encyclopedia of forms that you had to fill in to establish your bona fides and what the contracts were and stuff like that. But if you went to many African countries, you went to the, the ministry that was in charge of minerals and you asked them what their mineral policy was and what their policy was in minerals, the guy would scrabble around in a drawer and he'd pull out three sheets from the bottom drawer and he'd say, this is what our policy is. And I think that goes to the heart of what Alan Elm said, is that um, it's very easy to scapegoat. And I'm not excusing uh, exploitation by any of the imperialist powers, whether they're American, EU, or China. But the point is that if you don't put your own house in order, then you have no capacity to be able to deal with the problems downstream. And I think this is part of the problem. Ellen is right. You know, we have to put our own house in order. If you want to deal with China or the EU or America or anyone else, we have to be up our game very substantially. Thanks, Tony. Uh, Gilead, you'd like to come in? No? Femi, yeah, you can I think uh, a couple of sure. questions. Uh, Quite interesting. I'm happy to sort of share my two cents on them. So uh, I think there was a question about if we are seeing all this, I think this was from Femi, if we are seeing all the investment in infrastructure converging uh, at the port, or are we seeing anything happening um, uh, with respect to inwards? I mean, the last paper that I sort of looked at on, you know, on a similar subject spoke of the coloniality of, uh, of, of infrastructure investment in Africa, which is quite, quite the same. And one of the things that was striking when I'm looking at East Africa is that I think the happy thought of trying to connect 
Nairobi and Arusha has not occurred to anyone working in the infrastructure space. I mean, this is one of the largest hubs of tourism in Africa. And you have one of the largest hub of financial um, uh, and business and commercial investment in Eastern Africa, including the airline industry. But the happy thought of connecting, you know, these, I don't know, 300, 400 kilometers of two cities in the in North, um, Northern Tanzania uh, with, with, with the capital of Kenya has not happened, but everyone is just rushing parallel all the way to DRC. And I think that talks about about sort of the absence of this pan-Africanist thought when it comes to infrastructure investment. That is, that is just goes to that one particular uh, point. I think um, Elinor asked a question about um, um, if, if the hedging is happening or is occurring uh, for our interest. And one of the things that I'm finding out on the research now, it's quite interesting how, you know, one thing could be a different, I mean, the same thing could be interpreted in two different ways in two different instances. So, so for example, some of the early conversations that I've had with uh, my respondents with um, in Tanzania said, you know, China was, you know, earmarked uh, to be um, uh, to be the contractor for 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 the for the Tanzanian SGR. Same same way it was with the Kenyan SGR. Um, the government, when it came to power, the new administration came into power 2016. They say, you know, there were elements of corruption, so let's just scrap that deal and reopen the tender. And this is when the Chinese boycotted. And then a Turkish firm was um, uh, was announced. And now that that strategy of hedging in between them and trying to create competition worked quite well. They you know they got a competitive bid for the contractor. They, co they got a very fairly competitive bid for the the financing as well because that also goes in the same in the same bidding modality. And they have gone all the way to lot three, lot four. I think those are like sort of uh, uh, already in the pipeline, you know, the competition is, is working out quite fine. And then, um, you know, recently someone came with a happy thought that, um, you know, maybe we are too competitive. We need to hedge against um, having one firm winning competitively against it. We should single source a Chinese firm in a certain section of it. Uh, and it's quite interesting last week, uh, uh, on Monday, uh, during the discussions on the budget, one member of parliament raised a very important question, which I really hope when I go to the uh, to the field again to, to really research about it, that there is a difference of $600 million between uh, what the Minister of Finance had indicated in the budget speech, the, the amount allocated for the, um, uh, for the project, the, the Chinese section of the project, compared to what the public procurement system uh, had indicated uh, uh, to have given uh, allocated to, to, to the single sourced Chinese firm. So this tells me that on one side, you know, the same strategy was used to sort of create fair competition and, uh, uh, and, um, and, and have, and have a, a, a very good result, but at the same time, it was sort of perverted a different result, which we don't really know if that is the case or it's just a, sort of a misreading of events, but I think the jury is still out on that one. So you are right, I mean, about, about the hedging, it has really to work um, uh, to our own interest and that really depends on, on how, on, on what is the interest of the state or at least the actors that are working on that particular project at that point in time. I think there was a question on the reduction of um, uh, financing from multilateral institution. And this is quite right. I tried to point out that much more recently, these institutions, especially from the West, have been quite interested to fund more human development project, you know, general budget support, to have you know, several development policy operations. I've worked with, you know, along, along some of them uh, during my days with, with, with the World Bank as well. But what I have noticed is that the pretty much the determinant is who has the money. You know, with China, the state has the resources so they can have sort of state to state relations with African states and sort of um, uh, dish out these resources. But within the West, the money sits with firms. It sits with, um, um, you know, private companies, investment funds, you know, um, mutual funds and the rest of it. So the only thing that the state led institutions like the World Bank can do is trying to leverage the resources 
and hoping that the private sector will follow through and invest in the same investment. And this is why you have all these technocratic and very creative ways of financing, which tries to leverage in private capital. So your typical public-private partnership, your typical you know, bonds, infrastructure bonds, you know, mezzanine financing, you have things like uh, blending, um, you know, all these um, mechanism like road tolls and so forth, they are all designed to create, to make this infrastructure an investable proposition, which you can put in front of institutional investors. And they will put money, not for the importance of infrastructure, but merely as an instrument where you can get higher returns from. And I think this is the thing that you're seeing different between what's happening with China and what's happening with Western funders. I mean, the West simply can't do the traditional uh, investment, the bread and butter that China is doing. Uh, and certainly uh, uh, China cannot do what, um, what is happening uh, uh, in the West. I think those are the ones that I could call uh, for now and, and I'm happy to talk about some other uh, questions later. Over to you, Professor. We'll come back to Terry just now, but one question I have is, well, two questions. One is uh, how Africa can take advantage of this competition what you call superpower competition. Um, yesterday, the G7 uh, announced uh, 600 billion uh, investment in infrastructure in Africa to compete with China yesterday. Very significant. Um, that's the first. So how does Africa increase its capacity to take advantage of uh, this competition for this new scramble for Africa, one might, might call it. Um, and secondly, how can Africa as, as a block, as part of the Pan-African uh, project, uh, liaise with each other and create a, a kind of composite policy framework in which to avoid investors, including the Chinese, from playing one country against the other. And instead, I have a kind of a, a, a continental development plan into which all investment can, can get into. So for example, uh, in that regard, I'd like to, to make some comments at the end uh, on the kind of things happening in the East African community. Now, I forgot to mention this uh, as part of my uh, post pilgrimage to East Africa. Um, and I hope Molets is there to listening, but I discovered that the East African community is way ahead of SADC now, with very practical, in particular, with respect to open borders within and between their countries of East Africa. And there is no talk of anyone being a foreigner in East Africa. I sense that. Um, and certainly Kenya is pumping. And I think it, it soon overtake South Africa. Uh, but more important for me was the, the developments in East Africa, the East African Commission in particular, which are most of great interest. I'd like you to comment on those issues. Uh, before I come back to you, uh, Gilad, I'd like to hear or have responses to my to my question uh, to uh, those who are there, people like Moles Mbeki and Gordon Moye, who wants to come back, and Femi, who wants to come back. Please, some comments. What is to be done to increase Africa's capacity to run its own affairs, to capitalize on the investments, the competition that's at, at play, and move the continent forward? Anybody? Can you? before Gilead sums up. Gordon, Moyo, Chennai again later, Gordon. Uh, it, it, thank you, Ibo. Um, I think for me, the starting point is the African continental free trade area, the AFCAFTA. Um, if AFCAFTA is to develop the wings to fly and the feet to walk and jump, um, it should, in one way or the other, contribute to the questions, to respond to the questions that you have raised. 
Number one for me, uh, the biggest problem is that we do not have a shared or common Africa position when we are relating to countries like China. We have a small country like Zimbabwe engaging China I mean, with our 14, 15 million, engaging 1.6 billion. Uh, we have small countries in our legal countries engaging China as uh, at bilateral level. But if we are to use the AFCAFTA and we have our 1.3, 1.4 billion people in Africa with almost $3 trillion as our GDP and engage in China and we have a common position in trade, in investment, in various sectors of our economy, extractive industries, then we will have a voice. Then we will have a, 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 a space on the table where we can use our African agents to, to, to demand, because we do have what these countries want, what China wants. We do have the energy, uh, uh, the energy resources, the mineral resources, all these resources that we have. China would want to have them, but they are having it easy, simple because they are engaging us at the bilateral level. So if we had to go back to the African continental free trade area, try and galvanize it, and use it as a tool, use it as a vehicle um, for, push, for pushing forward a more pan-African agenda in terms of our, 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 of our development will go a, a very long way. So I'm putting on the table and submitting that um, uh, the African continental free trade area is the starting point. But obviously there are, there are weaknesses. Uh, there are always interferences and the people take advantage of that. The external world, including China and the rest of the Euro-Western countries, will always come in to make sure that even the African continental free trade area does not take root as it is supposed to. So I hear you and I think yeah, that's the starting point. And let me leave to, to others to complete the picture. No, th thanks, Gordon. Moletsi, Mbeki, welcome, Moletsi. Uh, yeah, hi. Thank you. Thank you, Ibo. Well, I, I think the, our starting point, we have to repeat it over and again, uh, which has just been made by the previous speaker. Africa is one of the, if not the most well-endowed continent with natural resources, is Africa. Um, the rest of the world knows this, but we, the Africans, uh, seem not to fully understand what, what, uh, uh, what the implication of, the, of that is. Uh, it means that Africa has a huge negotiating power if it wants to negotiate. We, we have the ability, we, we have leverage, we have massive leverage. Uh, you, you have, for example, geological formations like the Great Dyke in Zimbabwe, which you won't find anywhere else in the world. Uh, so you, you, you have this massive endowment that, that, that Africa has, and you can look at many other, uh, at, at, at many other uh, reasons, the water, and so on and so forth. However, we, we have to realize that colonialism destroyed very fundamentally the self-confidence of the Africans. And it replaced the African elite, our indigenous elites, it replaced them with a colonial middle class, which, uh, which is what became the nationalist movement, which doesn't have the confidence that our indigenous elites of, of the aristocracy who led the wars against the colonialists, they had the confidence that they could fight and defeat the colonialists. The, the new middle class that was developed during the colonial era does not have that confidence. And, and, and this is one of the crises that we have to address, especially as the intelligentsia in Africa is the issue of, of, of replacing uh, or, or changing the mindset of, 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 uh, of the intelligentsia in Africa 
uh, from that of dependence, which is what we, we have now amongst the elite in Africa. Just to give you an example, the standard gauge railway that, that are being built in, in East Africa, far from them integrating East Africa to the rest of Africa, they are actually isolating East Africa from the rest of Africa at a massive cost that is unnecessary. To build a standard gauge railway, it costs 40 times more than building the normal gauge railway that we use in Southern Africa. The, the gauge railway we have in Southern Africa, which goes from Cape Town all the way to Lobito, Benguela, um, Lubumbashi, Dar es Salaam, in fact, the Chinese built Tazara is part of the gauge that, uh, that exists in, in the whole of the Southern Africa region. What has happened in East Africa, the elite there was told to be modern, you have to build a standard gauge, which is 40% more expensive to build uh, that gauge. I raised this with the Secretary General of Comesa. I asked him, who is a Zimbabwean, by the way, he retired recently, uh, Cindy Songwe. I asked him, why did he allow the East African governments to build a standard gauge, which is a hugely costly uh, undertaking, which is totally unsuitable, unnecessary for, for the needs of, of Kenya and Uganda and, and so on. So he said he actually met with the presidents uh, of East Africa and told them that it's not necessary to have a standard gauge, but they said they want to be modern. And they understand that being modern means you have to have standard gauge. Now, Kenya has incurred this massive debt, which they are now unable to pay. So, so those are, are, are really the, 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 the major challenges that we, we, we are faced. China is not our problem. America is not our problem. Our problem are the elites in Africa and the, the holders of political power in Africa. Uh, one of the big problems is their lack of confidence. And of course, we, we have to find solutions. Now, just to close on the question of, of borrowing, South Africa borrows has a huge debt. I think 77% uh, of, uh, uh, of our public debt is 77% of GDP. But most of that debt is rent debt denominated raised locally. Why is it raised locally? Because the unionization of black workers forced the capitalists to have that the black workers must have medical aid, they must have pension funds, they must have uh, uh, those kinds of savings. And that's so South Africa has this massive internal saving. So when the government needs to borrow, it borrows domestically. It doesn't have to go to, to China. It doesn't have to go to the World Bank. It doesn't have to go. In fact, the World Bank begs South Africa to take money from the World Bank. Uh, uh. So these are the dynamics that we all have to start to seriously look into. Ibo mentioned uh, that what happened in East Africa in Dar es Salaam in the 1970s. Well, we have to re reproduce that experience that, that we had in the, uh, at the University of Dar es Salaam in the 1970s. We have to reproduce that kind of a center we, because it produced a very distinguished analysis about our problems and it produced also activists and people like Nyerere were, and Kaunda were responsive to the analysis that came out uh, of, the, of the Dar es Salaam school, as it, as it was called. So that's one of the things that we, we have to re revisit uh, are, those, uh, are those kinds of processes that have already taken place uh, in, uh, in Africa. Now, finally, the, we, you, Ibo was saying East Africa is ahead of SRADEC. Actually, East Africa, wh why East Africa has better cooperation processes is not because of the East African community, it's because of COMESA. COMESA 
is way ahead in terms of regional integration processes and the East African community countries are using the processes that were developed by Comesa. Uh, I'll end there, thank you. Thanks for a fascinating contribution. Uh, thanks a lot. Uh, I will call on uh, Femi and then after Femi, I have to, I'll go back to, to Chennai. And then last but not least, our panelist, Juliet Terry. So Femi, back again, Karibu one. Femi? Femi? Yeah, yes. So, so as you know, Femi is a typical Yoruba name from Nigeria, and I'm uh, living in Dar es Salaam. I, I, I strongly, strongly uh, believe, as most of us probably do on this call, in the Pan African verve that you know really must be regenerated, in a, in a very powerful way. Now, the, our last caller, um, let's see. You're right in saying that the intelligentsia is critical in all of this but I, I actually also believe that what from you know the engagements I have particularly with the youth is you know a popularization of the ideas you know breaking them down making things very simple and very accessible to you know our everyday folk I think oftentimes some of the wonders of what has happened in in the past have sometimes not always but sometimes stayed in the ivory towers we need to get this out to you know, the people. This needs to be a force that becomes unstoppable. We've always known how great the continent is and it has been great. So it's not a question of you know, our past 500 years is the sum total of the Africa experience on, on, you know, globally. It clearly is not, and, we, and that is known. But it's about regenerating this concept in our everyday lives. So that, you know, getting the youth to really take up the mantle as the Nereres of the, the Nkrumas have done, the Kowandas have done in a very kind of simple, simplified way and leveraging technology now. It's a different age. You know, the, the way in which youth, I mean, I, I have, we, we have, all of us probably have kids or, or someone, you know, adult kids, young adult kids, the way in which they, you know, traverse this continent now is incredible. You, in using and leveraging technology. And the global African kind of verve, you know, really getting this, uh, um, the ideas of you know, sharing amongst ourselves. It doesn't, it's not to the exclusion because the point is we're everywhere now. And that's why it is a global African discussion. So how do we, as, as you say, how do we, in, not so much reliance, there is the reality of, you know, these big infrastructural um, projects and how they're financed, but, you know, this can be brought back home. I loved what you were saying, well, let's see about, you know, self-financing within the continent. There is resources, there's an abundance of resources. We have to recalibrate, use if we, if we need to, a different form of, of, of uh, you know, kind of valuation, a, a different form of exchange. I know this is, some of this is controversial, but it's something that we ought to be able to do. And the thing is this, and I, I'd, I hear often, and I do capacity building as, as a lawyer and so on and so forth, but actually you go around the continent and the expertise in the continent or from the continent, because oftentimes we're not in the continent and we're doing this elsewhere, is phenomenal. We do have the resources plus the human, uh, human resources to get this job done. It's about bringing ourselves together again. I know it's an often, it's maybe cliched, but it stops there it's time to bring our pieces together. You know, we need to be one in that much more. i leave it there. Thanks. Thanks, Olga. Thank you very much. Uh, Chennai, the last words. Thanks, Ibo. Other than really uh, reiterating what everybody has said, I will say that Africa needs a change of guard. I think that's the elephant in the room. Currently, the presentation we have is of the mindset that Africa, we are beggars, we need help. And yet what all this is telling us is evidence to support the idea that we are very resource rich, that actually all these things that where we've got Chinese interest, they're selling these things back to China. So we are resource rich, we have something that the world needs. So we need to stop viewing ourselves on the back foot as somebody looking for uh, help or for free handers here and there. We are a resource-rich continent. 
we need to come together to appreciate what we have and to restore back some sanity into the way that it is financed so that we can have something to hand over to generations to come as opposed to this scramble for Africa from whether it's the West or it's from China. We really need to look at ourselves in a different light and present ourselves in a different light too. I think I'll end there. Thanks, Chennai. Thank you very much. Gilead, the last word. Yes, I concur with what uh, uh, Mulet said. I'd say uh, you know, I've found the same information in some of the experts that I'm talking to with respect to uh, the meter gauge railway. Um, um, you know, they said Japan and Australia also runs majority of its railway freight as well, still, still in meter gauge. So, I mean, it was really, um, I mean, close to a fool's errand trying to go this long route or achieve uh, sort of an expensive, uh, an expensive way. Um, but yeah, uh, the, the question you asked about what we can do now, uh, avoiding being played for a fool, two things came into mind. I think there are several economic solutions and there are a couple of political solutions that need to happen. One, I think integration is, is a huge solution. As much as there is a lot of institutionalization of that, the political favor of it has really died down. I um, mean, East Africa is one case in point that, you know, there are a lot of challenges now. I mean, there was a time when I think two years passed without heads of states meeting because one will not meet uh, if the other is present or something to that effect. I think institutional strengthening could also be quite a useful uh, path. So reducing, um, you know, political interference, enhancing uh, oversight and, uh, you know, the ability of these institutions and technocrats to sit in the, with the Chinese and, um, and engage, that's very important. On the, on the political solution, I think, I mean, everyone has spoken about Pan-Africanism and making sure that there is political engagements between countries, a commitment, uh, not just verbal, but also in action to some of these engagements and, uh, and agreements that we enter into, be it, uh, you know, continental free trade area uh, or, or else, and I think, the element of pan-Africanism, just having that sense of dignity and confidence and just going out there and making sure that we as African can certainly congregate together and, uh, and make things work um, on our terms is, is something that has to start from the mind and a bit of a collective ethos that um, our communities and our people need to develop to, 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 to complement all these other uh, institutional, institutional works. Uh, on that note, uh, uh, um, you know, Professor Ibo, I really appreciate um, the opportunity to uh, uh, to be here today and then to share my thoughts and my research with uh, with this group. Uh, it's been a fascinating conversation. Thanks, Gilead. I see a hand up there. Unless it's very urgent, I I wish to close the meeting. Uh, identify yourself. The one hand up. Okay. 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 Um, so, yes. Thank you, Dr. Yes. Mandesa. It's Farai. Yes, Farai. Go. Where were you hanging out? I'm sorry day? for coming very late. Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry about that. Um, some things Farai, are happening. Farai, but Farai, anyway, Farai. I just want to make a very brief intervention. Yes. I think um, what is needed, uh, of course, there are many approaches to dealing with this problem. The missing link in my view is the people power, the bottom up approach. My work is largely in the communities where extraction is taking place. And I've seen the collusion of our politicians, parliamentarians, including the opposition parliamentarians with Chinese investments. But I've also seen something that can work in certain situations where when the people are mobilized and are conscientized and are united to stand up against the Chinese investments, um, putting this, uh, the record straight on what they want and what they don't want. Sometimes I've seen the Chinese backtracking. Sometimes I've seen the government itself speaking the language of the people. And recently we had a case in Mutari where the Chinese wanted to start quarry mining. It is a mountain that is very dear to the local people and very close to the city center. And the politicians had endorsed the deal 
the city council had pocketed money, but we mobilized the residents, the civil society. We went public and say the city, they want to destroy an ecologically sensitive part of the city. At first, the Chinese also issued a statement and said we are puppets of the West. But we did not stop, and we even threatened the litigation. We threatened to go on site and say the army can come and kill us, but we are going to defend our mountain. And after a while, the Chinese said they are backtracking. They canceled the deal. So I think whilst the political and the institutional interventions are important, let's also capacitate the African people to unite and stand up to this Chinese bullying. Thank you. Well, thanks very much, uh, Farai. Farai Magu is doing fantastic work across the country uh, at, at the grassroots level. And um, I'm sorry you came in late. We're expecting you earlier. But I'm sure we'll be back to this kind of debate uh, soon. I think the major takeaway is that the Africans, we as Africans need to be get organized and take advantage of this clash of empires and, and, and not allow a repeat of the scramble of Africa of 1884, uh, which has left us where we are and see how we can, using a Pan-African kind of a platform, both through the AU, but also uh, you'll be pleased to know that we, we are convening in Kampala next week as at the steering committee of the Pan-African movement to plan the eighth Pan-African Congress. And, and one, these are some of the issues that will be on the agenda for the next Congress to see how we can work together with uh, African governments and the AU and the regional organizations to get us, us out of this mess. That note, I'd like, like to thank again, uh, Deborah and Gilead for really leading us in this discussion. We will, of course, publish the, the presentations, which are already recorded and are on Facebook and YouTube. Uh, we'll also publish them in the form of uh, policy, policy briefs uh, and, 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 and make that available to all of you. So on that note, I'd like to thank all of you, including those who have joined us from afar, like David Johnson uh, from Trinidad and Tobago, uh, and uh, Femi and many others who have come across, Patricia, and uh, hope is Patricia McFadden from Swaziland, Eswatini, uh, Sasa, Sasa Jogi. Uh, uh, welcome to, to this forum. And thanks, thanks again to all of you for joining us. Uh, we'll meet again in a fortnight. Uh, we'll be looking at either the Malawi crisis, the corruption scandal in Malawi, and all other crisis points, including, as Tony mentioned earlier on, the possibility of looking at uh, US interests in Africa uh, uh, as part of, and, and invite people like uh, Rupert Kargalia in, uh, in, in Joburg to read the discussion. Thank you. And 